Hello, I have an integral for you. Do you think that the answer to this integral is rational or irrational? What do you think? Well, I don't know neither, but today we have a really special guest speaker. He is Professor Omar and he's a professor from Harvey Mudd College. In this video, he will show us on how to prove if the answer is rational or not. And he also has a math channel that has a lot of interesting things, such as discrete math, GRE math questions, and also the put up exam question. So I would definitely recommend you guys go check it out. I will have the link in the description. His channel is for you if you also like math. Now, let's go ahead and welcome Professor Omar. If you look at this integral, you notice that the thing that you're integrating has a lot of square roots involved. So you might think that the integral is irrational, but it turns out that's not the case. And in this video, we're going to see why. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar from Prof Omar Math, and I'm very excited today to be presenting a video on Black Pen Red Pen's channel. Today we're going to talk about this integral right here, and that even though there are a lot of square roots involved in the thing we're integrating, the integral turns out to be a rational number. So to start, I'm going to let this whole thing here be f of x. Now you notice f of x has this like repeating property going on. We have this function negative six plus five root x, and it seems like we're like applying it again and again. So what I'll do is let this piece of the function right over here be g of x. And then if that's the case, then we notice that f of x can be represented in terms of g of x. Is g applied to itself a couple of times and then taking a square root. So if we write this explicitly, f of x is the square root of g of g of g of g of x. Now that seems kind of a little bit intense, but it will help us when we look at the analysis of the function f itself. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is investigate f and look at the value of f on these bounds. So for example, let's look at f of 4. Okay, g of 4 is negative 6 plus 5 times the square root of 4, which is, this is negative 6, this is 10, so we get 4. So g of 4 itself is 4, and f of 4 is the square root of g of g of g of g of x. Now since 4 is fixed under g, all of these iterations will end up with a 4 at the end, and so we'll have the square root of 4, which is 2. In a similar light, f of 9, if we plug in 9 into g of x, we get negative 6 plus 5 times the square root of 9. The square root of 9 is 3. And so this is 15 plus minus 6, which is 9. And so because g of 9 is 9, applying g 9 into this function right over here, we get 9 repeatedly, and we'll end up with the square root of 9 as the value of f of 9, which is 3. So we have two values of the function, at least at the bounds of this integral. So we'll draw a schematic of the graph of y equals f of x right over here. And doing that, we know that we have at least two points, the point 4, 2, and the point 9, 3 in the graph itself. So the next observation I want to make is about the domain of the function f. If we're integrating this, and f happens to not be defined at some of the values in here, we're going to get problems. So let's investigate that. The domain of f is related quite a bit to the domain of g, so let's take a look at the domain of g. So x starts off as being a number between 4 and 9. Now the question is whether or not all the square root stuff is going to cause problems. So if we actually compute g of x, we get 5 root x is going to be less than or equal to 5 times the square root of 4, which is 10, and 5 times the square root, less than or equal to 5 times the square root of 9, which is 15. This holds because when we take the square root, it preserves inequalities and multiplying by a constant preserves inequalities. Now, if we add negative six to each side, we get four is less than or equal to negative six plus five root x, which is less than or equal to nine. So four is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to nine. So this is helpful for us. If we look at this, if we start off with x being between four and nine, then g of x is between four and nine. So as we iterate this, our values will constantly be between 4 and 9. And so we can eventually, at the end, take a square root of that because our values are positive. So our domain, in fact, is this entire interval here when we're restricted to be between 4 and 9. Okay, another observation about f is I claim that f is actually an increasing function. 
And what we mean by that is if you pick two values, x and y, with x greater than y, then f of x is greater than f of y. Now again, because we've represented f as this composition with g a lot of times, what we'll do is check that g itself is increasing. If g is increasing, it'll be the case that g of g of g of g is. And then the square root, because we're working with positive values, will also be increasing as a consequence. So let's check that g is increasing. So here we have x greater than y, and that means that the square root of x is greater than the square root of y. Multiplying by 5 again preserves this inequality, and adding negative 6 also preserves the inequality as well. So we have g of x is indeed greater than g of y. And so applying this to this expression here, we get that f is actually an increasing function. So it's an increasing function defined on this whole domain 4 to 9, um, and it involves some square roots, so this graph might look something like this right over here. Okay, now we know that this function is actually increasing and defined on this entire domain. Because it's increasing, it must be the case that this function has an inverse. All right, so the inverse we can find as the function y that satisfies f of y is x. Now using this expression here, that means that g of g of g of g of y is x squared. And so we can rearrange this to actually figure out what y is in terms of x by unfolding g repeatedly. So if you actually compute explicitly, here is the function that is the inverse of f of x. Now you look at this and it looks kind of intense, but as an observation I want to make about this. You notice, this should be a square here, that it actually starts with a polynomial that you square, you add a constant, divide a constant, you square, etc., etc. So whatever this expression is, it's going to be a polynomial in the variable x whose coefficients are rational numbers. <clears throat> what that means is that this function, when you integrate it between two integer values, is going to be a rational number no matter what. Now the bounds of integration here, because f of 4 was 2 and f of 9 was 3, <clears throat> one reasonable place to integrate this is between 2 and 3. And so if you look at the integral from 2 to 3 of this function f inverse of x, <clears throat> it will be a rational number, again, because this expression here is gonna be this, which is a polynomial in x with a bunch of rational coefficients. So when we integrate term by term, we'll actually get rational numbers. So let's record that and then take a look at how that's gonna help us figure out that this thing is actually rational. Okay, so we have the integral from two to three of the inverse function is a rational number itself. The thing that we're interested in is figuring out that the integral of f itself is rational. And that integral is the area right over here. Now if we think about any random point on this particular graph, let's label that point. We could label it as x f of x, but we could also label it with y as the right coordinate and f inverse of y as the left coordinate. Looking at it from that perspective, if we shift our perspective in the picture and look at this graph instead of in this direction, in this direction, then this curve is actually the graph of the inverse function. Here's our argument and then here's the inverse function. So this integral right over here, the integral from two to three of the inverse is actually this black shaded area right over here. Now what's interesting about this is we know that this black region has rational area. Okay, however, we also know that the black region together with the red region, which is the area under this curve, can be broken up into three regions. These three regions are these three rectangles right over here. And so the area of the black region plus the red region totals to a value that's actually an integer because these rectangles all have integer side lengths. 
Okay, so that means that if we take this integral here, which we know is rational, and add this integral here, which we don't know much about yet, we know that the sum of these two actually is an integer. So this integral right here then is an integer minus some rational number, and so it has to be a rational number itself. So this is a really cool problem. <clears throat> I think one of the things that it gives us an idea about is the relationship between integrals of functions and integrals of their inverses and how we can exploit that to actually get information about integrals that we have at hand. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, please click the like button. If you want to see more videos like this, hop over to my channel, Prof Omar Math, and check out some videos there.